بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح الامه وجاهد في الله تعالى حق الجهاد حتى اتاه اليقين فصلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وازواجه وذرياته ومن اختفى اثره الى يوم الدين اما بعد indeed all praises are for Allah alone without second alone without a third along without any partner we know this and we believe this and we profess this and we manifest this we do it with our hearts first and foremost and also our minds with our tongues and with all of our quote unquote bodily limbs every movement that we do as muslims which is a means of devotion is a means of praising allah lauding allah and invoking him subhanahu wa ta'ala with through and by allah's perfect names his lofty attributes and his peerless qualities the mighty and the most high we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala for help for assistance we ask him to overlook our shortcomings and our faults we ask him to hide our mistakes and to prevent us from going back to those mistakes in the future after he has just forgiven us and covered those mistakes we ask allah azza wa jalla to protect us from our bad elements our negative insides whether it is the negative element of cowardice being a coward being afraid being scared from greed never being pleased never being satisfied having an insatiable nafs that's never enough with the halal the halal is never enough let alone the haram we ask allah azza wa jalla to protect us from deception and from treachery and from being untrue to ourselves being untrue to the people being untrue to allah the mighty and the most high we ask allah azza wa jalla to protect us from all of the negativities that have been innately instilled in the son of adam and if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't choose to do that for wisdom that he knows for wisdom that he has ordained and he leaves us to ourselves and we make mistakes and we fall into error then we ask him not to seize us and not to punish us and to forgive us for our ignorance and to have forbearance and to have courtesy those individuals who are guided who are upon the siratul mustaqim is not because allah owes them something it's not because of their intelligence or their knowledge or their strength or their lineage where they come from but it's only because allah azza wa jalla chose to give them that blessing he chose to endow them with that gift the gift of guidance and the gift of firmness upon that guidance and no matter what is brought to them of the pleasures of this world money women power influence material goods nothing can take that guidance away from them and we ask allah azza wa jalla not to make us of those who are misled and who are misguided those people whom it wasn't decreed and it wasn't ordained for them to be touched by this divine light and no matter how plain the message is no matter how much sense it makes no matter how beautiful the religion of islam is presented to them or how beautifully is prevent is presented to them they'll never ever become guided even though many of them are intelligent and many of them are smart and many of them may have quote unquote good hearts or good intentions but allah azza wa jalla did not will to purify them He did not will to guide them. That's what Allah chose to do for a reason that he knows. Huh? And for a, a proof and an argument that no one can contest with Allah Azza wa Jalla regarding. I bear witness and I testify that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is the one who should be worshiped. He is the only true God. He is the only one who deserves our devotion and our submission. And everything that we say and everything that we do has to be for him and only for him, the mighty and the most high. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad the son of Abdullah is his apostle, is his prophet, is his messenger, is his bashir and his nadir, his warner and his bearer of good news and glad tidings. And at the same time he was also a servant of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And this is from the beauties of Al Islam is that the messenger of Allah wasn't beyond the message itself. He himself was responsible for fulfilling what he told the people to fulfill. 
And this is something that the Muslims are to carry out today and uphold today. And unfortunately, this basic lesson is something that many non-Muslims have begun to practice today and many Muslims have begun to abandon and forget about. And that is the leader and the leadership and the government is not beyond the law. No one's above the law. You can take anyone to court. No police officer or agent can do whatever he wants to do. He himself is an agent of the law and he is responsible for implementing and abiding by that law. And the moment he steps out of line, you as a citizen have a right to take him or that agency to court because no one is above the law. And this is from the beautiful lessons of the Islamic history is that whenever there was a leader from among the Muslims who did something wrong, he wasn't beyond the Sharia himself. And the people of knowledge, they say that the Khalifa, the leader of the Muslims, if he does this crime or this act, he is now liable to the Hudud as well. He's liable to be removed. He's liable for this and for that. No one is above the law. So from the beauty of Al-Islam and the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is that he was a servant of Allah. He was a slave of Allah. And the word slave and the word servant, not like how we look at it or how we think about it. But to many people to this day, even if they're not Muslims, they look at the term servant as a noble term. A noble term. And that's why in the Quran and Kareem, whenever Allah praises the Prophet Sallallahu and whenever Allah mentions the miraculous things that he has done and that he does and that he will do with and to and for Muhammad, he always calls him his slave. Subhanallah asra bi rasulihi. Subhanallah asra bi nabiyihi. Subhanallah asra bi khalilihi. Subhanallah asra bi habibihi. La. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. If you have any doubt about that which we have sent down, ala abdina, our slave. Tabaraka ladhi nazal al furqana ala his servant. So Allah, he calls Muhammad his servant. And this is well known to many people to this day. They take honor and serving. So the Prophet ﷺ was a servant. At the same time, he was an apostle. He was a messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. And from the unique and special characteristics and traits of the Prophet ﷺ is that he wasn't just a normal messenger. He wasn't just a person who brought a piece of news or information or mail, courier, post. Someone brings you something in the mail, you say, this isn't what I ordered. I ordered something different, it looked different on Amazon, it was bigger, it was smaller, it was darker. No, it's not supposed to be like this. The mailman, the postman, he says, this is your name, sign, that's it. I have nothing to do with what you order, I'm nothing more than a messenger. But the Prophet said to me, it was deeper than that. He was a messenger who was to be obeyed, who was to be loved, who was to be respected, and whose statement and judgment and ruling was, to, was supposed to come before your own personal desires which is a miraculous thing in itself. How can you love someone more than your parents, more than your wife and your children, more than everything that you have? And you never met this man. You never experienced anything with him. You never came in contact with him. The Prophet says, you can't be a believer until I am more beloved to you than your children, your parents, and everyone else. How can this be? And your mother took care of you, she raised you, your grandmother, your wife is there for you, she takes care of you, she looks after you, your husband is there for you. These are the people that you're around every single day. How can you love someone not equally, not similarly, not a good amount of love? No. He says, Ahabba ilayhi, more beloved. That's deep. And the scholars of Islam, they explain this by saying, if you really look at the benefit that your parents give you, and the benefit that your siblings and the people that you deal with and interact with on a daily basis, it is of no comparison to the benefit of Muhammad sallallahu because Muhammad Sallallahu by Allah's permission, is the reason why you're not burning in the fire of hell. As the Messenger of Allah took pride in that. He took pride in that, the proper Islamic pride. He said, Alhamdulillah ladhi anqadahu bi min He says, all praises for Allah who chose me to be the reason behind this boy being delivered from hell, this Jewish boy. He said, all praises for Allah who saved the boy from the fire because of me. So loving the Prophet Sallallahu is something which is more important than anything else because Muhammad's benefit is immeasurable to the benefit of anyone else that can give you something material or look after you and take care of you. So the Prophet of Islam, alayhi salatu wasalam, he was the best of Allah's servants. He was the most humble of Allah's servants. He was the most persistent of Allah Azza's servants. And at the same time, he was a messenger. He fought in Allah's cause hard from day one. 
with everything that he had, physically fought in Allah's cause, spiritually fought in Allah's cause, verbally fought in Allah Azzawajal's cause. And we ask his name to be mentioned among the highest company of angels. And we ask Allah Azzawajal to be pleased with his companions, his friends, his supporters, all of those who are blessed with encountering him, alayhi salatu wasalam. We ask Allah Azzawajal to be pleased with his wives, our mothers, and his Ahlul Bayt, and all of the righteous Muslims who follow his way into the end of time to proceed. My dear brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, Al-Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, one day he said, he was speaking to some of his students. He was giving an admonishment to his ashab, his friends that sat around with him and studied with him and benefited with him. He said, Ya ibn Adama, naharaka daifuka, fa'ahsan ilayhi, fa'innaka in ahsanta ilayhi irtahala bihamdika, when anta asa'ta ilayhi irtahala bidhammika, wa kathalika laylika. He said, speaking about a reality, the most important reality, the greatest gift that Allah gave you, the greatest gift that Allah Azza has given you is nothing more than time. And he spoke metaphorically about the importance and the virtue of time and about properly managing time. To properly manage time. He says, O oh son of Adam, whoever you are, wherever you come from, knowledgeable, righteous, high-born, low-born, anyone and everyone is a son of Adam. He says, you have an Adam. He says, your time... Is your life, is your guest. Is your guest. So if you treat your guest honorably, respectfully, if you look after your guest, then be in the night Allah when your guest leaves your home, when he leaves your camp, compound, leaves your hotel, leaves your masjid, huh? bihamdika. He will speak good of you. He will speak highly of you. He will refer other people back to you. He will do things for you, he will pray for you. The list goes on. He will speak highly of you. But if you, treat your best the, if you treat your guests the opposite way, if you disrespect your guests, if you don't take the extra step in, in looking after your guests, then he will speak bad of you. He will spread bad things about you. Look how he treated me. Look what he gave me. Look what he said to me. He asked me, was I hungry? He asked me that I want something to drink. This is what he paid. Here, this, here take this for the gas and for the toes. This is this how he treated me. He will leave you and he'll speak like this about you. He says, so this is your daif, your day, and also your night. Also your night. So when you start talking about the month of Ramadan, and it being an honored guest, not just any guest, but an honored guest. In Islam, many of the scholars of Islam, they say that honoring your guest is obligatory and mandatory, especially in the early days of Al-Islam, in which the Muslims were, were few. The Muslims were weak. The Muslims weren't strong at all. And when the Muslims traveled and they went to someone's house and went to someone's home, it was mandatory to look after them, to keep the bond of the Muslims tight and strong. So if you have to honor your guest, whoever your guest is, what do you think about a guest who is esteemed, a guest of honor, a guest of knowledge, a guest of prestige, a guest of nobility? Then, of course, you're supposed to go the extra mile and the extra step and making sure that this guest is respected. And nothing about this guest coming to you is a small, easy, simple thing. Everything should be done to make sure that you accommodate this guest. So when I first went to the Prophet Sallallahu city, al Medina, all of the brothers who've been in Medina, they, they know there's a place called Suq al-Dawli. Huh? Or Sultana. And in this Suq, huh, is a, a, a market called Sarawat. Ah, it's a supermarket called Sarawat. If you had a little extra money, you wanted some uh, Frosted Flakes or some Cheerios or some Oreo cookies or some Tropicana orange juice or some type of Western commodity that you couldn't find in the normal Bakala or the Middle Eastern market or whatever the case may be, you would go there at Sarawat. So when I first went there, uh, when it was Ramadan time, you find advertisements, posters, you find different lamps, things all over the place. And one of the things that I noticed, I was 18 years old, it says, Jal Daif al Kareem. Al Daif al Kareem. This noble guest, this honored guest, this respected guest. So I was like, who is this person? Who is this honored guest this, that this is a big deal about? And then as time went on, common sense told me it's talking about Ramadan. It's talking about Ramadan. So I said, well, why do they call Ramadan a guest? 
Why is the month of Ramadan considered to be a daif, a guest? Anyone who's ever been overseas, he knows that the Arabs, before Islam, in Islam, and in this modern current age, there are a few things that they take pride in. Before the Prophet ﷺ came, there were only a few things that made a perfect or made a man perfect in their society. He knew how to ride a horse. He could pull back a bow. He could wield a sword. He could read and write. He could swim. He knew poetry, and he had basic knowledge of genealogy. He was considered to be a perfect individual. This, that, so on and so forth, not necessarily important for a person to be, for a person to have that type of status. And from the things that were considered to be basic staple practices was the honoring of the guests. And this was something that they had inherited from their great, great grandfather, Ismail, والسلام, who inherited it from his father, Ibrahim. As Allah Azza wa Jal, he tells us in the Quran and Kareem about how he treated his guests, whom he didn't even know. How could he know that they were honored guests? He didn't know where they were. Qawmun He couldn't recognize them. They didn't speak. They didn't talk. They didn't eat. But Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he says that ha faragha, that he immediately ran and fled to his family. And then he brought back a roasted calf. And another ayah we know says, ijlin samin, a fat calf. A big, large animal for them to feast upon. Ibn Sa'di rahim wa ta'ala, he says in the tafsir of this ayah, he says, this proves that Ibrahim salam's household, he says, ma'wa lidayfan wal musafirin. It was like a hotel or a motel. The door was always open for travelers and visitors. With the proof, the balagh of the Qur'an, is that he instantly jumped up and he ran back. It was nothing for him to make preparations for his guests. So the Arabs, they had inherited certain things from their forefathers, even though they were upon shirk, and upon kufr, and upon dalala. But there are certain things that they had as a means of extreme taboo, and things that you never ever did. And from those things was to disrespect one's guest. Rather, they would show off. They would go extreme. They would go beyond the natural limits to honor their guests. For what reason? For the purpose of good reputation. No one shall leave my house saying anything bad about me. Period. And anyone who says that I'm a bad host is automatically known that he's lying. Because it's well known how I treat my guests. Now, is that the proper Islamic etiquette? There is a balance. The Prophet ﷺ, he gave what he had. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ, when he says, فَلْيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَهُ huh? فَلْيُكْرِمْ, he says, جَائِزَتَهُ Give your guests his prize. It doesn't mean that you have to go out of your means. You give them what you have. As the Arabs, they say, الْجُودُ مِنَ الْمَوْجُودِ الْجُودُ مِنَ الْمَوْجُودِ They say, generosity is from that which you have. Generosity is from that which you have. But the point that we're trying to make is what? is that the month of Ramadan is considered to be a guest. From how many reasons? Hassan al-Basri, first and foremost. Suq al <laughs> Secondly, the marketplace. And also from common sense. And the proof that the month of Ramadan is a guest is that it only comes what? Once a year, like a guest. He only visits you what? Once a month. Once every, in the summer. That's it. I don't have time to go down south and, and visit you in Alabama. Just once, once, once a year, you go and you visit these family members, family reunion, for example. And you know that the time is limited, space is limited, and this person is someone that you love, someone that you respect. Then, be the night, Tyler, you know that you have to get yourself what? In gear. So just look at the depth of the word of Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala. Huh? He says that your daytime, your nighttime is a special gift, a special guest. If you look after them... This is what will happen. If you don't look after them, excuse me, that is what will what? That is what will happen. So, from the unique characteristics of an honored guest, is that the honored guest isn't just the receiver of good treatment. He's not just the one who eats and drinks and sits back and fills his belly. But an honorable guest always brings you good as well. They always make you happy. They always revive and resurrect that which you've forgotten about, such as knowledge. The sheikh has come to you. The student of knowledge has come to you. Your old classmate has come to you. Not only are you going to take care of him, but he's going to revive what may be a little rusty, maybe some cobwebs or something that you forgot about or something that you become so busy in the dunya with, you don't have time to debate and argue and go in this book and go in that book. So the beauty of an honorable guest 
is that they benefit you as well. They tell you a story. They give you wisdom of traveling. And it increases you as a Muslim and you as a host as well. And that is the similarity and the parable of the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is not just to be respected, but Ramadan is supposed to be welcomed. Because Ramadan is a traveler and an honored guest that brings a big, large goodie bag. Brings a big, large, fat goodie bag. Ramadan brings you benefits, but only if you open up your door and allow it to come to you. So an honored guest does something for you. If it's nothing more than just talking with your guests. Hmm? Being cordial, spending a couple extra nights at night talking, drinking tea. That's a benefit for you and for your family. He plays with your sons, so on and so forth, etc. And that is what we want to talk about and what we want to discuss with regards to the month of Ramadan. Is that not only is it an honored guest, but it is a benefit for us. And it brings us things. It reminds us, it teaches us, and it enlightens us. So with regards to this masjid, and the renovations that are uh, being done in this masjid, and the renovations that the brothers and sisters plan to do in this masjid, and the funds that are necessary, and the shame that we have to get up and beg for money, and ask for money, and badger people and annoy people to give money. We want to discuss what is the month of Ramadan going to do for us with regards to the problem that we have, and that's the problem of stinginess. That's the problem of tight-fistedness. Huh? He said, short arms or what? Deep pockets. <laughs> Clinging and clutching onto things that in actuality we don't own. Things that don't belong to us in reality. But, brothers and sisters, it isn't anything which is strange. It isn't anything which is out of the ordinary. It's something that Allah Azzawajal has told us about. That man, he says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعَ He says that man has been created... Halua. He's been created in a state of hala. What is halu? What is hala? Allah Azza wa Jalla. He mentions two things. Allah basically tells us in these ayat that man, even though he's grown and he's supposed to be mature, he's nothing more than a little baby. Man is like a brat, a toddler, a two-year-old. What do babies and brats do? When they have a toy, it's my toy. They don't want to share it. They don't want to let no one play with it. Even though they need this other kid to have fun with. But this is my toy. They weren't thinking about the toy. The toy was sitting there. The moment the other kid picks it up, he runs and he tries to pull it. Huh? The child is stingy. But at the same time, if the child falls, if the child trips, if the child gets hurt, when the child gets cranky, what's the first thing that the child does? It cries and it screams. It needs its mother or its father. The child is weak. The child has no sabr, no patience, and at the same time, the child is stingy and mean. Think about this, and think about the human being, now, the psychology of a human being, a grown human being. And what this ayah means, in that man was created, halu'an, is that when good comes to man, he's what? Stingy. And when bad comes to him, any odd type of adversity, he immediately despairs. He cries, he curses, he rips, he scratches, he punches, he hits the stereo bill. Oh, son of a this, God, such and such. That's the first thing a man does. The moment any problem comes his way. But the moment when it's good, it's smooth, everything is tayyib, you'll never hear man complaining. Just like a little baby. And this is the interpretation of this term that man has been created, halu'an. Because Allah, Azzawajal, he mentions the exact same thing. He says, Allah, he tells us that when things come, good or bad, this is how he behaves and this is how he reacts. But he previously mentioned the word halua. And the scholars of Islam, they say that this word means the exact same thing that's mentioned in those following two ayat. But Allah is explaining it and he's breaking it down. The man is like a stingy baby. When it comes to his toy, my toy. He falls, he trips, he's hurt, he's hungry, he needs help immediately. And he has no sabr. So this is a sickness. It is an illness, and this is one of the natural elements that have been placed inside of the human being. Huh? As the angels, they said, Will you place in the earth a slaughterer, a butcher, someone that will spill blood, that will cause corruption? Allah says, I know that which you don't know. I know that which you don't know. In other words, 
I'm going to create man with the natural innate ability and desire towards being stingy, towards being tight-fisted, and those who fight themselves and overcome their natural stinginess have the highest status of my created beings because they're not like the angels that are created from light, that know no vice. But you have the default to be stingy. So when you're generous, and when you give for Allah's sake, in actuality it's only for your sake. That is a major spiritual achievement because you have stifled your nafs. And the nafs is naturally created with stinginess, naturally. You're naturally made with wanting something for yourself. So with regards to the month of Ramadan uh, and its virtues in light of the prophetic tradition uh, and what this month does for us as humans, as Muslims, our spirits, our minds, our bodies, and also with regards to fighting the vice of stinginess, we want to, inshallah ta'ala, use a slingshot and uh, shoot one stone to kill two birds at once. With regards to raising funds for this masjid, Raising funds and giving for the renovations of this masjid, well, I don't think it's ever been a time I've come to this masjid. All of the times that I've come or I've been cold or hot in the summer or the carpet was stinking or smelling or the electricity wasn't on. I don't think there's ever been a time where the hummed. And that's an accomplishment. That's a praiseworthy thing, but it doesn't come for free, brothers and sisters. There is no government endowment. There's no spending that people get in a, a, a systematic way. The masjid only exists through the donations of the pockets of the congregants. Now we all know this, but we forget this. And oftentimes we fall victim to our natural human stinginess. So with regards to the month of Ramadan and its virtue and its superiority, now we didn't say fasting now. We never said fasting. The virtues of fasting, that's a whole different discussion by itself. Because you can fast any day as long as it isn't the, certain, the specific days that are prohibited to fast, such as the days of the Eid. As the Prophet ﷺ was asked by one of his companions, what's the best deed? What should I do? Give me advice. He says, He says, fast, because there's nothing that's comparable to fasting. The Prophet ﷺ says, He says, if you fast one voluntary day for the cause of Allah, Allah will take you 70 years away from hell. So fasting and its virtues, that's one discussion. Ramadan, for women who are pregnant, women who are menstruating, men who are traveling, men who are warriors in Allah's cause, men who are sick and they're not fasting, is the month is still virtuous. Everybody understand this? The month is still virtuous, even if you're not what? Fasting. So what about if you're fasting in the month of Ramadan? Everybody understand this? The sheer time of Ramadan is virtuous. Fasting is not a requirement for the month of Ramadan. Nor is the month of Ramadan a requirement for fasting. There are people, men and women, who don't have to fast. Rather, it's haram for them to fast in the month of Ramadan. It's unlawful for them to fast. And there are others, they have the ability to fast if they want. And if they don't want to, then they don't have to fast. So there are two different topics we have now, huh? What we want to talk about right now is the virtue of Ramadan and not the virtue of fasting and what Ramadan is going to do for us as being stingy human beings. Huh? Khairan inshallah ta'ala. Fi sahihayni an ibn Abbas an radiallahu ta'ala anuhu ma qala kana nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwad an nas wa kana ajwad ma yakunu fi Ramadan hina yalqahu Jibreel fa yudarisuhu al Quran wa kana Jibreel yalqahu fi kulli laylatin min Ramadan fa yudarisuhu al Quran فلا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حين يلقى جبريل أجود بالخير من الريح المرسلة وخرجه الإمام أحمد بزيادة في آخره وهي أن لا وهي لا يسأل عن شيء إلا عطاء الجود هو ساعة العطاء وكثرته والله تعالى يوسف بالجود وفي الترمذي من حديث سعد بن أبي وقاص رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الله جواد يحب الجود كريم يحب الكرم وفيه أيضا من حديث أبي ذر رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن ربه أنه قال يقول الله تعالى يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وحيكم وميتكم ورتبكم ويابسكم اجتمعوا في صعيد واحد فسأل كل إنسان منكم ما بلغت أمنيته فأعطيت كل سائل منكم ما نقص ذلك من ملك إلا كما لو أن أحدكم مر بالبحر 
فغمس فيه إبرة ثم رفعها إليه وذلك بأني جواد واجد ماجد أفعل ما أريد عطاء كلام وعذاب كلام إنما أمري لشيء إذا أردت أن أقول له كن فيكون وفي الأثر المشهور عن فضيل من عياض إن الله تعالى يقول كل ليلة أنا الجواد ومن الجود أنا الكريم ومن الكرم فالله سبحانه وتعالى أجود الأجودين وجوده يتضاعف في أوقات خاصة كشهر رمضان وفيه أنزل قوله تعالى وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان وفي الحديث الذي خرجه الترمذي وغيره أنه ينادي فيه مناد يا باغي الخير هلم ويا باغي الشر أقصر ولله عتقاء من النار وذلك كل ليلة ولما كان الله عز وجل قد جبل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم على أكمل الأخلاق وأشرفها كما في حديث أبي هريرة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال إنما بعثت لأتمم مكارم الأخلاق ذكره مالك في الموطأ بلاغا فكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس كلهم وكان جوده بجمع أنواع الجود من بذل العلم والمال وبذل نفسه لله تعالى في إظهار دينه وهداية عباده ويصال النفي إليهم بكل طريق من إطعام جائهم ووعظ جاهلهم وقضاء حوائجهم وتحمل أثقالهم ولم يزل صلى الله عليه وسلم على هذه الخصال الحميدة منذ نشأ ولهذا قالت له خديجة في أول مبعثه والله لا يخزيك الله أبدا إنك لتسل الرحم وتقر الضيف وتحمل الكل وتكسب المعدوم وتعين على نوائب الحق ثم تزايدت هذه الخصال فيه بعد البعثة وتضاعفت أضعافا كثيرة الحافظ ابن رجب رحمه الله تعالى he says in the most uh, his famous work لطائف المعارف which is a book that every Muslim should have some knowledge of we've done classes from this book we've done a summary on this book and the book is basically a calendar the book is basically if you want to sum it up it's a calendar and it's a calendar of worship is basically showing you out of the 12 lunar months or solar months is that every month there's a holiday. There's a holiday. Every month on one scale or another, there is some virtue, some superiority, some excellence, something to do for your spirit. That's what the book is. You know, like you have a calendar on the wall, calendar of mosques around the world, calendar of sports cars, huh? And every month is a different image. And in the calendar, you see this holiday, this national day, this Independence Day, this so on, so on and so forth. You have a calendar. So this book, Lataif al-Ma'arif, is basically a spiritual calendar. He wrote a book to show you throughout all 12 months, there is no dry season. There's no such thing as a dry season and a rainy season in Islam. There's always some type of water. There's always some specific special virtue for you to gain through the kitab and the sunnah. So Shawwal, Shaban, the Qada, Ramadan, Rajab, Muharram, etc. The Islamic months, he talks about the ahadith that deal with the special virtues of those months. Obviously, one of the most important months, if not the most important month, or at least one of the most important in this calendar, is that of Ramadan. Not of fasting, but of what? Ramadan. And in this month, he mentions a very special hadith. And that is the hadith that he mentions of Abdullah ibn Abbas عنهما, in Bukhari and Muslim. And this hadith says that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he was the most generous. There was no one who was more giving than Muhammad. But despite that fact, listen carefully to this hadith and ask yourself, how does this make sense? He says, الناس, he was the most generous of people. And he was even more generous when the month of Ramadan came. He was even more generous when this month came. How and why was he more generous? When Jibreel السلام, came and brought him a gift. Now look, and Allah knows best, perhaps this is yani, ajaz ilmi. Look at this miraculous hadith that Muhammad والسلام, was most generous in the month of Ramadan when Jibreel came in to teach him what? The Quran. And Allah Azzawajal, he gives the title to his book being what? Kareem. He says that the Quran is bountiful. Noble is one translation, the noble Quran. That's only one translation. But the word kareem means bountiful. Someone who gives, 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 and they never, ever stop giving. As Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu 
narrated, even though the hadith is not authentic. It's not authentic, but the meaning is, speaking about the Qur'an, he says, لَا تَنْقَضِي عَجَائِبُهُ He says, the mysteries and the marvels of the Qur'an are endless. There's never a time when you get bored of reading the Qur'an. The same story, each and every time you read it, Musa and Khidr, you get a new benefit. You get a new reflection. SubhanAllah, that's amazing, that's deep. Some scientific thing is discovered each and every time you read the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is called Kareem. It's called Bountiful Book. So that is from the reason behind Muhammad Sallallahu being even more bountiful because Jibreel bought him something which was bountiful and that was the Qur'an. Abdullah ibn Abbas he says, so Jibreel والسلام, not only did he bring him the Qur'an, he says, daddy Quran. he would teach him the Qur'an and they would study it together. They would, they would learn it, he would teach him huh, and explain it to him, not just give it to him. It then says, وَكَانَ جِبْرِيلُ يَقَاهُ كُلِّ لَيْلَةِ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ And every single night Jibreel came to visit him and teach him the Qur'an. فَيُدَارِسِهُ Quran. And when the Prophet ﷺ studied the Qur'an, he was more generous, his generosity was more comprehensive and more enveloping than what? The sun, the moon, rain, water. That's not what Abdullah ibn Abbas says. He says, أَرِّيهُ mursala. He says, like a calm breeze. A cool wind. Who doesn't get touched by the wind and affected by the wind? Everyone. What living creature doesn't grieve? The fish in the sea, they have what? They have gills to allow them to do what? To breathe. So everyone needs oxygen, they need air. So the Prophet ﷺ, he became like this rih mursala that was calm, that was cool, and that was sent. Yani li ta'meem. Everyone enjoyed his what? Generosity. Those who didn't need monetary uh, spending, they got a generosity through something else, through another way and through another means. Ibn Rajab, Rahim Allah he says, outside of Sayyain and the Muslim of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, there's another version of this hadith or another uh, addition to this hadith that says, is that he was never asked for anything except that he gave it. That was the meaning, that's the explanation of his what? Ramadan generosity. Is that nothing that he was asked except that he would what? Give him. And we know this is from the greatest principles of being a great leader. In Islam and outside of Islam. And that is for the word no not to exist in your vocabulary. There is no such thing as the word no to a true leader. There's no such thing as no. He never tells someone who asks him something what? No. The Prophet he told the companions about the virtue of those who enter paradise without punishment, without disgrace, without reckoning, without this. And he mentioned their number. And we know the companion who stood up and asked him. He says, Ya Rasulullah, Udu Allah and Yajalani minhum. He says, Ask Allah to make me from them. Or Kasha. He says, Enter minhum. Fakama Rajulun Akhar and another man stood up and he said, What? Make, ask Allah to make me from them. He said, What? You're not from them. You won't go to Jannah. He says, Sabaqa Kabiha. Okasha. He says, Okasha beat you to the punch. Sorry. <laughs> and he never told the man what? No. He never told him no. That's the meaning of wisdom. Because the word no is relatively harsh. Yeah. I'm going to try, inshallah, I'll try my best. Let me get back with you. Let me see what I got. So on and so forth. No, I'm not doing it for you. I can't give it to you. Everybody understand this? So the Prophet was never asked for anything except that he did what? He gave it because of the power of the Quran. However, Allah tells us, that some hearts are harder than stones and harder than rocks. As if the Qur'an has no effect, what? Upon some of those hearts, unfortunately. Khairan, inshallah. Ibn Rajab, rahim Allah ta'ala, he mentions many different side narrations and side hadiths, which we're not going to translate. And many brothers, they may say, well, it's unfair that you read it in English, but you won't translate it. No, it is fair. It's fair. I haven't impressed you. I've given you something. Those who know Arabic or are familiar with the book, who've memorized it and studied the book more than I can read it, they get a benefit. And if you want to learn everything, you want to get everything, then you need to do what? <laughs> learn Arabic. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Moving forward. Classes on Sunday. Huh? Inshallah. Huh? Ibn Rajab, he says that due to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal, he raised and he nurtured his prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, upon the best of character. Not good character, but what? The best of the best. The Prophet's character was the cream of the crop. 
There was no character that was better than Muhammad والسلام, and it wasn't anything which was more honorable than his behavior. As the Prophet والسلام, has said in the narration of Abu Hurairah, I've only been sent to perfect the best character. Since this is the case, the Prophet والسلام, his generosity was totally comprehensive. He gave his knowledge, he gave his wealth, he gave his physical self to establish the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to guide Allah's servants. He gave himself to improve the quality of life of all of the people who encountered Muhammad والسلام, every way that he knew possible. By feeding those who were hungry, admonishing those who were ignorant and heedless, and looking after the needs of the needy. And bearing their burdens. In other words, he was a true leader. He was a true leader. Someone that you could depend upon. And someone that didn't sleep if his followers were restless. Who didn't eat if his followers were hungry. He didn't drink if his followers were thirsty. He didn't run and flee from the battlefield. He didn't lead from behind strategically. The companion said that whenever the battle became fierce, we would surround ourselves upon the Prophet Sallallahu and rally through his courageous bravery. So the Prophet ﷺ, he, his mission, he's saying here, was to give the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything that they needed. Everything that they needed. And this is from the wisdom and the fiqh of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. It was the Prophet ﷺ, he was always like this. And when he was afraid, when he was scared, when he was sweating, he was shaken up by Jibreel ﷺ tremendously. And some of the ulama of Islam, they say that the Prophet's death, a part of it was from his initial encounter with Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. Some of them say that he never fully physically recovered from that initial encounter. And Jibreel alayhi salam says, فَغَطَّنِي That he enveloped me and he, 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 huh? Huh? he scolds me. Huh? <laughs> I tell you, I know I was afraid <laughs> They say, you made a mistake, you got to say squeezed <laughs> What's important is I, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha That was the very first thing That she used as a proof And as a delil That the Prophet sallam, what he saw was true Okay What he saw was true and that Allah would not disgrace him His good characteristics Before he was a prophet in the time of the people's jahiliyyah. Ibn Rajab, he says, وَفِي تَطَاعَ فِي جُودِهِ صَيْسَلًا فِي شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ بِخُصُوصِ فَوَائِدُ كَثِيرًا He says, and there are many benefits behind the Prophet والسلام's extreme generosity in his month. If there were benefits for the Prophet, then what do you think there are benefits for you? Right here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If Muhammad benefited from those, from those acts, and his companions benefited from those acts, then what about us here in this masjid? He says here, first and foremost, men have sharaf wa zaman wa mudaafatu ajr al amali fi. Wa men ha yaanatu saimin wa qaimin wa dhakirin ala taatihim. Fa yistawjibu al mu'in lahum mithla ajrihim. Kama anna man jahaz ghaziyan faqad ghaza. Wa man khalafahu fi ahlihi faqad ghaza. He says, first and foremost, is the Prophet ﷺ, the reason why he was so generous during this month is that he knew that the time was noble. He knew that the time was a guest. The guest is not staying forever. It's only a few nights, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, then the guest will be on his merry way. You have to look after the guest when the guest comes to you. He says, so first and foremost is the Prophet ﷺ knowing and realizing that the time was noble and that rewards as... Abu Abd Razak mentioned, you may get one reward for sadaqah that you give. You may give seven, you may get seven, you may get ten. You may get 700 rewards. You may get an infinite amount of rewards from a dollar bill or $20 or $50 or a C note, a hundred dollar bill. <coughs> Only Allah knows the rewards that you may get. It's a hundred dollars to you. Only Allah knows what it will be with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, on that day in which you will claw and fight and strive for each and every single hasana. And you will beg and wish that you had as many good deeds on your scale as possible. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ Allah says, he whose scale is heavy, they are the successful people. So the Prophet ﷺ, he realized this, is that Ramadan wasn't a normal time. It wasn't an average time. It was something special. And deeds were flipped and multiplied in that month. Another reason why the Prophet was so generous during that month 
It was to help those who were fasting, to look after them, and to help those who are standing at night, to help those who are making dhikr, those who wish to obey Allah Azza wa Jalla. For what purpose? Just to help people out? No. But he says, for your stojib, he will receive a similar reward like they got. So, man fatara sa'iman, he or sa'iman, he who gives iftar to one who's making fasting, as if you yourself fasted. And the Prophet says, man jahaz a ghazi and faqad ghaza. When there's a warrior for Allah's cause, if you outfit this warrior, you support his battle as if you went out and fought yourself. And those who can't go to the battlefield, I'm too old, I'm too weak, I don't have a mahram, I'm not a strong, brave man, I'm not tough, I'm not, I, that's, that's not my department to fight. He says, وَمَنْ خَلَفَهُ فِي أَهْلِهِ بِخَيْرٍ And if you remain home and look after his wife and his children and take care of them, فَقَدْ غَزَى then you yourself has fought, your fought as well. He says, so this is from the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ did these things. وَمِنْهَا أَنَّ شَهْرَ رَمَضَانَ شَهْرٌ يَجُودُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ عِبَادِهِ بِالرَّحْمَةِ وَالْمَغْفِرَةِ وَالْعِتْقِ مِنَ النَّارِ لَا سِيَمَا فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَاللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ يَرْحَمُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الرُّحَمَاء كَمَا قَالَ صَلَيْهِ سَ فَمَنْ جَادَ عَلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ جَادَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ بِالْعَطَاءِ وَالْفَضْلِ وَالْجِزَاءُ مِنْ جِنْسِ الْعَمَلِ Another reason is that the month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah displays His generosity to His slaves. In which Allah, who's, who's already generous, Allah's hands are totally extended, He says. مَبْسُوطَةً Allah doesn't clench His fists. His hands are open, He says. But in the month of Ramadan, He gives even more. So the Prophet ﷺ, he realized the universal principle that you reap what you sow. And what goes around, comes around, as we say. That's what's meant by that statement. You reap what you sow, what goes around, comes around. Is that if you're merciful and kind, then it's automatic law that Allah Azzawajal will be merciful and kind to you. So raise your hands right now if you don't need Allah's mercy. If you have enough good, you don't need Allah's mercy, you can raise your hand. Raise your hand if you don't need a lot to give you. If you work hard enough or you're smart enough, you have enough money saved up, or you come from a wealthy background, you don't need anything from Allah. Raise your hand. I can't raise my hand. So if that's the case of the Prophet Sallam's intelligence, then we need to take an example from this. That the month is not a normal, basic month. It's a time to emancipate yourself from the fire of hell. Women how? أَنَّ الْجَمْعَ بَيْنَ الصِّيَامِ وَالصَّدَقَ مِنْ مُوجِبَاتِ الْجَنَّةِ is that when you do fasting and charity, this is from the reasons behind you going to paradise and being delivered from the fire of hell. Having a one-two punch combination. Not just fasting, but also what? Giving, spending as well. He then says, وَمِنْهَا أَنَّ الْجَمْعَ بَيْنَ الصِّيَامِ وَالصَّدَقَةِ أَبْلَغُ فِي تَكْفِيرِ الْخَطَايَا وَاتِّقَاءِ جَهَنَّمْ وَالْمُبَاعَدَةِ عَنْهَا وَخُصُوصًا إِنْ ضَمَّ إِلَى ذَلِكَ قِيَامُ اللَّيْلِ Another reason is that when you fast and when you give sadaqah, it has a greater power of removing your bad huh, deeds. When you wash your white kufi, Omar, what do you wash it with? You, you just use detergent, right? You also put it in what? Bleach. Bleach with the detergent or maybe vinegar or whatever you use in which you have a double what? Agent cleaning agent to remove any dirt, any dinginess from your white. One is sufficient, it's enough, but I want to make sure that it's what? Crystal, everybody understand this? So this is the concept of the soul. You wash yourself good and clean. Huh? You, your mother, she said, scrub longer. Don't get out the bathtub yet. Wash up again. Make sure you're what? Totally clean. So when you fast and give sadaqah, it's a means of you doing what? Cleaning yourself and make sure that all of your sins are removed. Ibn Rajab then says, وَمِنْهَا أَنَّ الصِّيَامَ لَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَقْعَ فِيهِ خَلَلٌ وَنَقْصٌ وَتَكْفِيرُ الصِّيَامِ لِلذُّنُوبِ مَشْرُوطٌ بِالتَّحَفُّضِ مِمَّا يَنْبَغِ التَّحَفُّضُ مِنْهُ He says, another reason is no matter how pious and righteous you are, is that when you fast, you have to have a shortcoming. There is a flaw in your fasting. No matter how good you fasted, there's something that you didn't do right. There's a day in which you lost your temper. There's a day in which you took another look at that uncovered woman or that man, that handsome man. 
there's a day in which you did something, whatever the case may be. It's something that you did of nux. And even if you didn't make a sin, you didn't complete it and, perf and perfect it 101%. He says, so giving sadaqah, being generous in this month, is a means of extra credit. Just like the prayers. Why do you make two before Salat al-Dhuhr? Or four before Salat al-Dhuhr? Why do you make the rakat before or after Salat al-Asr? Ala khilafin fi dhalika. Why do you make two rakats after Maghrib? Two rakats after Isha? Why do you pray at night? Why do you make two rakats before Fajr? Because your khushu and Fajr is not 100%. You didn't make dhur in the right, perfect time. You didn't make asr when you're supposed to make asr. Exactly. You had a shortcoming. You thought about this. You reached for your phone. You scratched yourself. You had some type of nux. So you need some type of extra credit. You need a second coating of paint. So the Prophet والسلام, he wanted to make sure, and I don't think the Prophet would have made a mistake in fasting, but to teach his followers is do not rely upon just fasting. Don't rely upon that. Do extra credit. All of the time, especially in this month, in the month of generosity. So the point, brothers and sisters, uh, I humbly believe is crystal clear, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, crystal clear. And that is the month of Ramadan is extremely virtuous. And we don't have enough time to speak about the, the virtues of the month of Ramadan in light of the authentic sunnah of the Prophet The time in general, as we've stated, is a guest, an honored guest. And the best guest that you can get is the guest of Ramadan. So what do you want to do during this month, brothers and sisters? As we mentioned in the khutbah earlier today, that Abu Hurairah narrated that the Prophet he says, Sinfani min ahlin nari lam arahuma. He says, there are two types of people that will be in the fire of hell that I have not yet seen. They didn't exist in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, He says, the first type of people, he says, are men who have whips that are long, that are thick, and that are vicious, like the tails of cows. And they whip people and they slash people's backs. They will go to the fire of hell. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Nisa'un, Kasiatun, Adiatun, Ma'ilatun, Mumilatun. He says, women who have on clothes, but they're at the same time naked. Women who are astray, and they lead others astray. And he says, and their heads are like the humps of camels, meaning the prostitutes. The prostitutes in the time of the Prophet, or before the time of the Prophet. As the scholars of Islam, they say they would take turbans or wrappings or their hair and they would wrap it and bundle it up to make themselves stick out and to bring more attention to their clients and to their customers because they were prostitutes, they were whores. That is the proper meaning of this hadith. The hadith doesn't necessarily mean it's haram for a woman to wear a bun on top of her head. It doesn't necessarily mean it's haram or dislike for a woman to have a ponytail on her head. It doesn't mean that. But it's a specific intention behind this hadith. And we said that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, these women, they would not, they would not enter paradise. And they would not enjoy the fragrance of paradise. So the scholars of Islam, they say what's meant by this hadith, kasiyat ariyat. He says there are several interpretations that Noah mentioned. For, from them is the literal meaning. And that's the asal, the default. Is that they have on clothes, but they're undressed. And this hadith, among many others, shows us that the Prophet ﷺ was true. And there's no doubt that was a true prophecy because there are women today who wear clothes as if the clothes are not there. As if they aren't there. There's no purpose of those clothes. And the second interpretation of this hadith, he says, Kasiatun min ariyatun min shukriha. Is that they have Allah's blessings they're wearing, but Allah's thankfulness, they're naked and they're void thereof. And we explained this hadith applies to the month of Ramadan as well. Is that there are many of us as is mentioned in the other hadith, Abu Hurayr and Muslim of Imam Ahmed, it says, Rubba sa'imin hadhuhu min as siyam al ju'u wal atash. Some people who fast, the only thing they don't get is hunger and thirst. Some people have on clothes, but in actuality they're what? They're naked. So it looks like we're fasting, it seems like we're fasting, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we have headaches, but our spirits, our tongues, our hands, our eyes, our ears, our credit cards, our wallets are not fasting. And that's something which is dangerous. And from the greatest things to do during this month is what we have explained. 
is not just to fast. Don't just avoid food and drink. That's not just fasting. Fasting is everything else as well. And you should fast from your stinginess. You should fast from your bukhl. If you can't control your stinginess, you have a lot of bills. Why should I give the masjid? What are they going to do with the money? They're mismanaging the money. They're mishandling the money. They're this and that. Maybe. Mumkin. But at least do it for 30 days. 30 days during this month. And perhaps Allah Azawajal will remove that illness from you. And perhaps you'll be from those people that will have on that what? That expansive coat of iron. That chain mill. And the stingy miser. Whenever he thinks, when he thinks about giving sadaqah, each link pinches his flesh. Huh? And it becomes to his neck and over his chin, over his head. He's engulfed and enveloped by his stinginess. Stinginess is an illness and a sickness, brothers. So if you don't have the ability to fight this monster all of the time, then at least try to fight it during this month. This, I believe in Allah's best. I've completed my mission with regards to reminding myself and reminding you of the virtues of the month of Ramadan, the honor guest, and the importance of giving sadaqah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this masjid and all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's masjids. Allah azawajal surely knows best. I thank all of you for your generosity, for your time, for your respect. Um, unfortunately, I had to talk, and there were people that were better than me, had to sit in the audience and listen to me, and I mean that. Perhaps be the Taala another time, I can sit down and listen to benefit while they talk. Jazakumullah khairan. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد